Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neosystems CMMC Town Hall. Now I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Thank you, Don, and welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on cybersecurity maturity model certification. My guests today are Bill Walter and Eric Crucius, although uh, Eric, Eric just changed his name. I saw he was <laughs> misnamed at the beginning there. Um, I do want to mention before we get started that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Um, our sketch note artist, Wade Forbes, who's normally with us for these sessions, is not going to be here today. Uh, so apologize for anybody who looks forward to those drawings. Um, our focus at Neo Systems as a managed service provider is on organizations seeking certification, and that's primarily who we have in our audience today. If you have some questions from the audience, please send those in on the Q&A feature in Zoom, and I'll make an attempt to get those worked into the conversation with, with Bill and Eric. Um, I'll start with introductions. Eric Crucius is a partner at Holland and Knight, law firm specializing in, in uh, government, well, he specializes in government and technology contract law. He received his JD from Hofstra in 2000 and has been practicing law for over 20 years with a strong focus on representing government contractors and technology companies. Also today uh, joining us is Bill Walter. Bill is a managing director, director at Dixon Hughes Goodman LLP. They're a top assurance tax and advisory firm. Bill has over 25 years of experience in government contracting, including cost accounting, federal acquisition regulation, contracts and complex negotiations, DCAA audit requirements, and, the, and GAAP. Um, after starting his career as a DCAA auditor, Bill has been a consultant advising and representing companies ranging from Fortune 100 to sole proprietors, uh, primarily on government contracting matters. So Eric and Bill, thanks uh, very much for, for joining us today. And thanks for having us. Yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Our, our, our topic today is going to be the impact of current events on the supply chain and potential cyber attacks. Uh, we've certainly got a lot of uh, fodder, at least for the discussion. Um, I'll start out with a question for both of you and then maybe alternate, but you know, feel free to feel free to jump in with all, any relevant comments. Um, you know, we've all been tracking Russia's aggression against Ukraine, including cyber attacks that they did preceding some of those military actions, some retaliatory actions back on the Russian assets. As, does this escalation mean, you know, what, what does that mean for those of us in the defense industrial base, in your view? Well, I'll start. Um, you know, whenever there's some kind of geopolitical issue like this, it, it really can impact um, the cybersecurity um, that companies have. Uh, obviously, one of the ways that Russia is going to lash out against the um, against the alliance that has built up against them is through cyber attacks. And that's what they've been trying to do for years. But now I think they have more of an incentive to kind of use the information that they've gained and use the tools that they have um, against, against companies in the United States. And one of the biggest ways where they can create damage is, of course, targeting government contractors, the lifeblood, you know, of, you know, pumping services and products uh, to the American people and to the military. So I do think that you know, contractors in particular should be on higher alert right now um, for possible cybersecurity attacks and malware and things like that, because Russia is going to try to find a way to get an upper hand here uh, in this conflict. Uh, they're obviously having difficulty through conventional military means, although they'll probably eventually get there in kind of trying to kind of keep the U.S. off their toes and heels and other countries too. One way to do that is to kind of run through these cyber attacks that they can that they're capable of doing. So I think contractors as a whole should be especially vigilant now, um, more so than usual. They should always be vigilant, but especially now, and just kind of keeping an eye on things. And maybe this is a great time to do security training for your employees. If you have something that's off the shelf that you're thinking about launching, no time like the present to get that done, of course. No, I, I agree with that. And I've, I've always been a history buff. And you go back in time over the years, communication is such an important part of life that long before social media and the internet was invented, uh, communication was still a, a big part of disruption. That would be one of the first things they would go in, cut the telegraph lines, uh, knock out the newspapers, cut out the radio towers, things like that. So um, it, is, it is definitely something that we're seeing and all of us are touched. Even here in Northern Virginia, uh, not too long ago, we had the pipeline that was taken over. And while they weren't the defense industrial base, everybody in the defense industrial base was hit by that as well as the fear. So cyber, it's, it's, it's unknown. We know it's out there. We don't know what the impact is going to be. 
Uh, so clearly, I agree with Eric. If if you if you do have training in place, great time for a refresher. Uh, very important for everybody to stay vigilant and uh, just be careful with what you do and follow those good rules that you've set up as a company. So, Bill, I'll, I'll toss this next question your way. That yesterday there was an article in the Economist. Um, with the headline reading the digital war that wasn't yet. So they were talking in that article about the fact that, you know, in the past, Russia's had some really devastating attacks that they've, they've placed on Ukraine. They mentioned the not pet yet attack from 2017, which, you know, at the time that that happened was the, the most damaging in terms of dollar impact of any, uh, any attack. And that was a direct, you know, um, Russia versus Ukraine attack is how it started. Had a lot of collateral damage. Um, the article also noted that you know, we haven't seen anything on that scale yet in this current campaign. Um, th there's, you know, been no major disruption of t Ukraine communications infrastructure. It seems that, you know, cell phones and other internet is still working there. Um, the article puts forth a few theories. One is that the Russians may be relying on and using some of those communication services themselves, right? That they're, they're using cell phones to communicate on the battlefield and, and don't want to take it down. Um, the other theory was that, you know, they made some attempts, but those attempts have failed, that the, the Ukrainians have uh, successfully um, warded them off. Did you or or do you expect that cyber warfare will play a larger role in this in this kind of conflict? Well, in in, in any sort of conflict, there there's so much outside of just the the bombs and the attacks of the troops and things like that. So, and I'm I'm not a a politician, but you know I I do think historic history shows us that there's going to be a lot of careful posturing out there between the various parties involved. Uh, but there could be some natural fallout. If the Russians are trying to attack the, the Ukraine uh, networks and with their cyber attacks, uh, with the alliances that are out there, some of that could overflow and, and knock out uh, some inadvertent target that uh, could be impacted. So there's going to be a lot of second, third, and fourth order type effects. And uh, if that happens to hit one of the NATO alliance or hit the U.S. or hit one of the other uh, countries that are out there supporting the Ukraine, um, you, you, there's always fear of a reciprocal response. Well, we'll, we'll take care of this. And, uh, you know, we just got out of the Cold War not too long ago. I mean, I grew up living in that environment. It was kind of exciting to get out of it. But now it's kind of like, well, we've got that fear in place. Uh, something else we need to be mindful of is the big solar winds attack from a few years ago. People think that they kind of have an idea of what's going on, but it was so massive. There may be uh, overlying elements of, of that that uh, haven't been triggered and haven't been pulled yet. So um, Russia could be holding their, their cyber cards close to their chest and just waiting for the right time to pop it out. Um, I did think it was an interesting read. I really appreciated you sending the article, uh, but it, it raised a lot more questions for me than, than I have answers for the, the people who've joined us. And then uh, even this morning, um, Symantec announced that, you know, you mentioned that some of this stuff maybe lying in wait for a long time. Symantec announced this morning that the, a piece of malware that their researchers have discovered, they've now made public. It was Chinese, Chinese government malware that's been in place for over a decade, right? So this has been in place doing something for over 10 years. They're not sure over the next few days, I'm sure we'll find out a little more about where this might be installed and what they might've been doing with it. Um, but you know, that's, yeah, long-term persistence here is, is definitely a, a feature when you're talking about players like China and, and, and Russia. Um, Eric, I'll, I'll switch over to you. On, on Monday, Toyota announced that they shut down their production lines after a cyber attack, uh, presumably a ransomware, kind of a routine ransomware situation that happened at one of its suppliers. So Toyota has like 60,000 suppliers in their supply chain. They specialize in sort of just-in-time parts delivery is, is one of their you know operating efficiencies. But out of those 60,000 suppliers, one gets taken out by ransomware and now they can't get some critical parts Toyota paused all of its Japanese production lines for a couple of days until this could get sorted out. Um, how do you see that sort of event and, and that sort of you know, impact affecting how large companies think about the risks that they're inheriting from their downstream suppliers? Gosh, how many hours do we have to talk about that? Because like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I um, so this goes to the core of, just to bring it to CMMC for a second, this goes to the core of CMMC and why subcontractors all the way down to COTS suppliers are, you know, except for COTS suppliers are subject to the CMMC requirements, not just the prime contractors doing business with the federal government, because time and time again, the issues that we see 
are often focused on those subcontractors. I've mentioned this before, if you've seen me speak before, but the target breach that happened a few years ago was not target. It was a supplier or subcontractor, I should say, to target. And um, I think that's why we're seeing kind of uh, moving away from the CMMC. That's why we're seeing prime contractors require certain cybersecurity prowess uh, for their subcontractors and including even if it's not required, I bet we're going to see a lot of them require CMMC certifications, even outside the DOD, as a way to, to give them some assurance, give those prime contractors some, some assurance that those subcontractors are meeting, meeting the requirements that they need to meet to protect the information. So, um, you know, I think this is just another example in a long line of examples that the subcontractors are often the weak links and prime contractors and the federal government are going to do everything they can to address that, mostly by making them comply with CMMC and other, you know, similar regimes, even if it's not a requirement in the contract, they're going to make it in the subcontract agreement. So that way, those subs will have to do it. And if a subcontractor is not willing to kind of go through those hoops, then the prime will find somebody else to do business with who's more than willing to do it. So um, I think this Toyota um, thing, and it, it shows you how, how tenuous the supply chain is too, but we've seen that over and over again throughout the pandemic. Um, but I think this Toyota um, breach just kind of illustrates again that um, subcontractors are, are going to be a focus of CMMC and other kind of similar regulations. Yeah, I mean, and Toyota's lauded for making a really taut supply chain, right? I mean, they they want it to be really, um, you know, no no slack, no 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 stuff sitting around in the warehouse. Right. So, you know, that's a that's a feature, not a bug. But then it, it makes you more susceptible to this kind of a a concern. So yeah. Bill, um, so Eric, Eric, oh, go ahead, Eric. Do you have I was else? just gonna say it's great until it's not right <laughs> to have yeah. a supply chain yeah. like that. So, Bill, um, Eric mentioned CMC. This is a CMC program after all. So, I'll I'll, I'll continue down that thread a little bit. One of the concerns that gets raised about CMC and, and, and other security regulations as well is affordability for small business. So do you see any of these sort of recent developments we're talking about, do they change the risk calculus for small businesses? As they're trying to decide, can I afford this? What makes sense to spend on this? You know, is it is it different because of some of this? And, and maybe to sort of add on a question there, who pays for it? Who should small businesses expect to pay for this kind of protection? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting, as, as we talked about so far, the, these events really highlight the importance of, you know, having, we have such a reliance on cyber with our economy, with our businesses, with communications with our employees, uh, we, we have an obligation to them to make sure that we're taking care of those things. Um, our firm, uh, we've got amazing amounts of training and things that we have to do, things I could do five years ago, plug a thumb drive into my computer, I can't really do that anymore. We've, we've got a lot of these things that are little micro steps along the way uh, to, to really take care of that we need to pay attention to. And I think that all the stuff that we're talking about right now really highlights that. Uh, the cost when we were talking about CMMC originally when it came out, it, it was going to be very expensive for companies to get prepared for all these criteria and all the requirements. And and make sure that their company can, can satisfy the requirements of the, the 7012 clause that was coming out. Um, and I, I think that was kind of a, a big reach for a lot of companies uh, going back to CMM or going to CMM 2.0, where we're basically going to the NIST 800 171 standard. I think it makes it more realistic for a great number of companies to be able to take those steps to be prepared and, and try to do the right thing. Uh, so I do think that companies who are looking at this, CMMC is right around the corner. I want to protect my systems. What can I do? Um, so I, I really think that it, there are some companies that do take it seriously. There are other companies that are just waiting for the right moment and others that think it'll never happen to me. And so I, I do think that this is kind of a, a wake up call. There's just been so many of these things that are coming around that can basically put companies out of business. That, that if you want to, continue to go forward, you need to look at that. But who's going to pay for it? I get that question quite frequently from companies. They're like, Bill, you know, is the Department of Defense going to issue a modification of my contract to pay for this? I, I doubt it. I doubt it highly that uh, they will do that. It's going to be something that companies are going to have to pay for and find a way to build it into their cost structure and their bidding structure for their work. So 
their rates may go up a little bit, their profit rates may go down a little bit. How the, the competing um, defense industrial base members uh, address it is going to be how these companies are going to have to figure out how are they going to get this done. So no time like the present. If you haven't already started, you, you really need to make sure that you've got the right steps in place. Uh, Eric, I'll, I'll shift over to you. That you know, in the defense industrial base, I mean, a lot of us have been rethinking our defenses, doing what Bill just suggested, right? So there's a lot of people that are taking action and really making some changes uh, in response to CMMC coming out, even though it's not a contractual requirement yet. We we all see where it's where it's heading, and we know there's some lead time. So that's gotten a lot of focus on the problem. There's been a lot of discussions that I, I would say just weren't happening two years ago, right? And people were talking about different business challenges. Um, as you look at this, look at the response of industry, how people are reacting to these regulations, to the threats we just talked about. Are we doing it right? Do you think, I mean, are we, are we taking the right steps or making some mistakes? Um, I mean, I think from a readiness standpoint, I wish, you know, in some respects, I wish we we're moving faster. I, as, you know, even though I represent contractors and contractors, of course, are generally adverse to some kind of regulation on their businesses. But, you know, there's a couple of things I wish that was happening. One, I wish this was happening faster because even though this is a significant regulation, it's also, you know, the threats there aren't waiting for us to, to issue final regulations. The threats are happening every day, every minute, every second. And it's high time that we try to do something about it. And there are some regulations in place. They issued not just the 7012 clause, but the DFARS clause under 7019 and 7020, which requires, you know, a, a, a scoring of, of your compliance with 800-171. But we're not seeing anything like that on the civilian side either. Um, another, a, a couple more things. I mean, I really do wish that DOD had a program that allowed, you know, for, for folks to get certified and have somehow have DOD pay for that. Because I think we're losing small businesses from the defense industrial base who are too afraid to kind of incur this cost based on the speculation that they may get a contract one day, or maybe the contracts they're getting are not worthwhile to undergo this cost. Um, and now because it's being rolled out over time, which is not inappropriate necessarily, but because it's being rolled out over time, Bill mentioned correctly so that, you know, companies are gonna have to build this into their GNA and overhead and account for it. Um, there'll be some companies that wait longer to get a CMMC certification. So maybe they'll have more favorable rates, you know, but maybe they'll, there's a downside to that, of course, because they won't have a CMMC certification. So there'll be companies that don't want to do business with them. But if they're prime, if they're a prime contractor with the federal government, perhaps by waiting, they'll win, you know, a couple of extra, um, you know, competitions because their rates are lower because they're able to be lower because they don't have the CMMC cost. So I think you know a couple of things the government could be doing is maybe finding a way to kind of pay for CMMC compliance in a in a way that's appropriate, and trying to and that would eliminate the problem where you have different companies having different GNA and overhead you know burdens because some have the CMMC compliance and some don't because of the eventual rollout, um, you know, and and finding a way to kind of make this palatable to to those tech companies that DoD is always trying to attract. You know, through DIU, um, the De Defense and in in Innovation Unit. Um, you know, there those folks are probably not really too keen on getting a CMMC certification to do business with the federal government. So, but all that being said, it's that tug of war is not an easy thing to solve because, yes, those companies may not want to go through this rigmarole. But on the other hand, you know, this rigmarole is kind of necessary to protect um, the assets that DOD has through itself or through its contractors. And without it, we're just going to continue to kind of lose ground to the Chinese and Russians and others who, instead of going through a, a you know a very expensive R and D cycle, is just going to you know breach into a system and, and steal everything. Well, what about on your side? Are, are you seeing people that are doing it right, doing it wrong? Are you seeing any kind of I'll say common mistakes, things that people are doing in their approach that turn out to not get the desired results for the money they're spending? Yeah, I mean, first off, we see a good number of companies that are doing it the right way. They're finding success. They're, they're educating their team. They're, they're strengthening their systems. They're evaluating the different elements. So there, there are a lot of good companies and there are a lot of companies that are doing it well. 
But for the companies that aren't doing it well, I'll, I'll break it into a couple of quick um, examples. Uh, number one, there's some companies that are sitting there, like I said earlier, it's not going to happen to me. So they're not planning for a successful attack. Um, so it's important that you think about what's going to happen. You know, how do we stop a, a likelihood of an attack? What are the types of steps we need to do? And second, how do you mi minimize the impact of a successful attack? What are the types of things you can do? And a big hot term in the marketplace today is cyber resiliency. Okay, we can take it and we can move forward. So how do we bounce back quickly? And uh, all the members of the DIB, they, they need to take care to make sure that we, we figure out how do we be resilient. So that's the, the first one that I say. And, and the second, as people are coming into CMMC, they're not really appropriately scoping the environment. They're not considering, you know, what is the impact going to be, let alone within our own framework, but what about with our suppliers? What about our third parties who have access? And what about our subcontractors? How do all of these things fit together? So uh, th those are two of the areas that we're kind of seeing with our team uh, as, as the bigger ones right now. I agree with you on scoping. That scoping guidance that came out in December, I mean, it's still relatively new, is uh, adds a lot of specificity to what you do and don't need to pay attention to. And I think a lot of people have taken too narrow of a scope and the scoping guide is now opening up those blinders, forcing them to open up those blinders. So um, maybe cause a rethink for some folks that, you know, thought they had it under control and maybe they, maybe they don't. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned several of the things that are get brought into scope that you have to uh, consider. So, and one of them you mentioned, Bill, was uh, service providers. So, Eric, um, thinking about those, I'll call them utility components, service providers, cloud service providers, these are, you know, commonly used software. We've seen some targeted attacks. Uh, Bill mentioned solar winds a minute ago, but we've seen some very targeted attacks against the software vendors, against the service providers, where the idea being that the attacker can invest heavily in an infiltration of one company and access many companies. So they, they get to many targets with one successful attack and it's been working for them. So I, we gotta assume it's gonna continue. Do you see the government shifting emphasis towards those companies, software vendors, cloud providers, managed service providers? Yes, and we saw an executive order from the Biden administration last year kind of outlining, you know, how, um, how you know, actions the government should take in conjunction with contractors to kind of protect that software and to to issue reports uh, when that software is breached. Um, you know, we haven't seen a ton of action in the last few months from that, but I expect that we will. Um, they're probably in their writing and drafting stage. And we should see um, proposed regulations sometime this year that have emanated from that executive order. And I think it goes to the kind of the larger picture that the government has, which is they, they feel, and I'm not saying they're wrong, that it's better to buy things on a larger scale uh, because it's in, in a lot of ways it's safer because you're you're only have one system to keep track of instead of 28 systems to keep track of. So if you're putting all your energy into protecting that one system, you're going to have a better system. But on the other hand, it's a bigger target. And um, on top of that, too, if there is some kind of you know problem with the system, it's going to impact a much greater sphere of the government. Um, you know, we saw the Microsoft Exchange hack uh, also which was all over because everyone uses Microsoft Exchange. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of, there's no perfect solution or else we would have arrived there already. Um, you know, obviously there are advantages and, and Congress has pushed the government to do this to looking at these cybersecurity products and technology products and making them certain services and making them more widely available. In fact, there was a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act about that this year. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see that push, but I hope folks, and I think they are, are cognizant of the added risk that goes along with it if we're not properly protecting those systems. Agreed. Bill, I'll, uh, I'll ask a qu question about CMMC 2.0. We, we have hashed out some of the changes um, on this program quite a bit. One of them that kind of sticks out as being relevant to this supply chain discussion is the, in CMMC 2.0, they got rid of the CMMC unique requirements and aligned just with the NIST 800-171 standard. So great benefits of doing that in terms of government-wide consistency and the ability of NIST as a standards body to kind of evolve things using methods they are, already have in place. But now you've got this sort of the Delta 20 so-called, right? Those, those controls that have been now deprecated from CMMC 
Um, they included additions that covered integrity, availability, things that 800 doesn't cover. So that shifts the, the burden for those back to the contractors. We're watching the, what's going on in, in, in the Russian campaign, uh, Russia-Ukraine campaign, distributed denial of service attacks on both sides have, have been kind of one, one of the things we've seen. Is the, do you think the supply chain is taking those risks, those threats seriously? If it's not required, are they going to do it? Are they taking it seriously? Well, my initial off-the-cuff response would have been, yeah, I'm not sure that they are. But uh, about a month ago, VHG became the sixth C3PAO authorized group out there. And we've had a lot of contact with many companies as a result of that. And in talking with these companies, I find that there are an amazing number of companies out there that are taking this very seriously. They want to get the audit done. They want to get this stuff complete. So it was very refreshing to, to see the number of companies that want to be on the leading edge of that. They've been paying attention. Even though it's CMMC 2.0, they know what those other requirements are. And they've got that built into their resiliency platform to make sure that they can uh, go well. So the, to answer your question, yes, there are elements of the supply chain that are taking it uh, seriously. But there are also some people in the supply chain that's just like, hey, that's one more thing I got to worry about. I got to make payroll this week. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got so much money in the budget. I want to spend more on business development. So as, as we work through that, it's just like we have with anything else. Some companies are doing a very good job. Uh, other companies aren't paying much attention to it. And we got a lot of companies in the middle of the road that are kind of um, slowly moving forward. And these events will hopefully help them understand how, how important that that is so that they can reprioritize their budgets over time. Agree. I, payroll definitely important. So <laughs> uh -huh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you got to keep those priorities. So um, audience question I want to squeeze in here. Um, has has there been any further discussions uh, surrounding how the government will prioritize CUI and knowing which things are going to qualify for the self-assessment versus the third party assessment? So Bill, if you guys are in a 3PAO uh, certified mode, has there been any guidance that you've seen on that? Well, I know we're getting a lot of talk about CUI. Um, my biggest frustration is the biggest adversary we have on CUI is the government itself. Um, not every agency takes it seriously. They got rid of the old for official use only. Some of the agencies are labeling things as CUI, and they're not really CUI. So I, I think we still have a lot of maturity that's going to be coming out on that. Um, but the guidance is much better today than it was a year ago. And it was better a year ago than it was two years before. Uh, so I think it's consistently developing as, as CMNC gets tested, we're gonna get a little bit more uh, insight as to what, what that should be. But I know that there's a lot of work within the DOD that we're not seeing right now and NARA that are saying, okay, how, how do we move with this going forward? But, it's, it's still, to me, one of the biggest questions that I get from clients is, let's talk about CUI. I got CMMC. Let, let's talk about what we have to protect because it's just so broad. And the risk that is associated with that to companies is, to me, uh, one of the biggest elements out there. Um, Eric? Yeah. Um, CUI is the weak link in this whole thing because I think there's a lot of confusion over what is CUI and when it applies. I mean, I've talked through to numerous companies who have suffered cybersecurity breaches who are DOD contractors or subs, wondering if they have to report based on the information that they have. Yes, we have the CUI registry, but oftentimes CUI is not labeled, which it should be. And um, it's completely unclear whether something is considered CUI or not. And that's, that's the bedrock of all these things. It's the bedrock of the regulations. It's the bedrock of CMMC. So we have to kind of straighten out what CUI is and in fact, the, this year's National Defense Authorization Act does have a provision that aims at clarifying what CUI is. There is a proposed regulation that should be published soon that addresses the same thing. I think it was supposed to be published last year, actually. So I hope we'll see movement in this area because I think that will help kind of tighten up what, what contractors are supposed to do. The other side of this question is about, you know, the uh, announced plans to kind of bifurcate CUI so that depending on the type of CUI you have, you may or may not need a third party assessment. And DOD CIO had a series of um, webinars over the last couple of weeks, they had three, three webinars, all the same content. And one of the positions that they talked about in there was that 
um, the intention is that most CUI is going to be in that category requiring a third party assessment. And it sounds like more of an exception basis, they'll allow the self assessment. So I think when that first came out in December or November, I guess the MOC 2.0 came out with this bifurcation, I think a lot of people thought it's going to go the other way, right? It's going to be a, only a few people will need a, a 3PAO assessment, CPPAO assessment, and most will self-assess. DOD CIO is saying, no, they're, they're definitely guiding in the other direction that that self-assessment will be the exception, not the rule at level two. Mm -hmm. You guys hear anything different in that regard? That's what I'm hearing too. And I think it makes sense. And I think what contractors seek is clarity. So if, if they know that they're going to probably need to get a third-party assessment, so be it. Um, just so long as they know and, and having kind of willy nilly contracts come out one way or the other is not really an easy way to operate. It creates a lot of confusion. Contractors just not knowing from contract to contract, whether they'll need a third party assessment. So I think that's well, a positive development. And, and one way to solve that is to get a voluntary assessment. So if you, if you're not sure which contracts you're going to win next and what those contracts are going to require, um, getting, you know, being prepared by getting a voluntary self-assessment as soon as they're you know, commercially available. That's that's what I you know, I would think would be the prudent move, right? You can't go wrong with that. There is some cost, obviously, versus a self assessment, but um, now you're sure. You're sure you're certified, and you're sure it's going to be acceptable, regardless of the type of CUI that you end up with. I work with a lot of companies that want to get their disclosure statement in place for compliance with the cost accounting standards, even though they don't have a cash covered contract, because it's it's really a tool for the business developers to find new opportunities. And I think this is going to be the same way. Um, yeah, it's going to be a, a tool that they can use. So we're at the we're at the bottom of the hour. Let me ask uh, both of you just a quick a quick wrap up, maybe summary. Um, as a wrap up, how should we just you know actionable takeaway? How should we in the audience um, change our security stance as a result of the current events that we're seeing today? Well, for me, being the the consultant in the crowd, I'm going to say it depends. If you're already on the leading edge, if you've been getting your stance in place and you're doing well, keep up with it. I mean, keep going, take it to the next step, get those assessments. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, have somebody else look at it besides your own team, make sure you're doing well. And if you're kind of thinking your IT department's taking care of it, uh, it's time to really step up to make sure that they are. So if you're not engaged, get engaged. And if you are engaged, keep up that level of support because I, I think it's going to be giving you great returns in the near future. Well, Bill, it's the lawyer's job to say it, it depends. So I'm really kind of sad that you went first. I'm a <laughs> consultant. It's, it's always it depends. <laughs> no, I just think, um, especially in this climate, having that extra vigilance like Bill talked about and Ed talked about, I think is super important. If you have, um, if you have that, the option of doing some security training now is the best time. The, the weakness is always in the humans operating the system. So that click on a link or open something, that's the vast majority of where we run into problems. So a little refresher on that is probably can't hurt too much. Good, thank you. Thank, thank you both for those uh, pieces of advice. Um, I did get a late, late breaking audience question that says the issue with quotes we've received for C3PAO assessment are astronomical. It's not comparable to other assessments. So I'll squeeze this in at the risk of running way over our time. So Bill, you guys are doing this. Is there something different about this assessment under CMC that's causing it to be astronomical, not comparable to other assessments people might get? Well, it's a tough thing because I've, I've seen assessment prices all over the place, depending whether it's a financial statement audit, a SOC one or two type audit assessment or other types of things. So uh, what I would recommend is uh, for an assessment, reach out to Tom Tollerton in my office. Ed can give you his information and you can get an idea uh, from him. And if he's the one that's already given you the astronomical quote, then um, I, I, we can I, chat. It didn't sound like it was necessarily from you guys, but yeah, no. But I, I, I know that it is it is expensive and companies have not budgeted for it, but this is the type of thing that it, if you start moving forward, you're going to uh, have to take care of it. You're, you're gonna have to build that in. And it's still cheaper than responding to a breach. Thanks for that. Let's let's close on that note. Um, appreciate uh, both of your time today. Um, audience members, thank you for your time and good questions. Uh, please join us for future town hall meetings. Our next session is going to be a week from today, Wednesday, March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern, our usual time. If you don't have a registration invitation in your inbox, then please go to our website, 
neosystemscorp.com, where you can find all the details. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.